Hello and welcome to another episode of Beyond the Eclipse. Uh, my name is Aethor and I have with me, as o- as I will always, uh, I have V. Hey. And we're going to do episode 3 of t- TLD today. And I think it's a pretty solid episode. But to catch everybody up on, because it's been a while since the last one came out, the idea <laughs> here is that uh, we go through the TLD backlog, we listen to it, we talk about like this and that and the decisions that V made along the way. Uh, I want to start by thanking our patrons, who are the reason why we're making a second episode. It was a stretch goal, and they actually met it like a month ago, but life has been hard. Life has been rough. Uh, We promised we would do episode three, and we will do episode four at some point pretty soon. So it may even come out when we release this one. We don't know yet. We're just doing one episode at a time as life dictates we have time for. (laughs) (laughs) Very much so. So episode three is called... Um, the choices we make. Yeah. Or the choices we made. I don't remember exactly. The choices we make. I uh, have it in front of me here. And uh, the read-in on this episode is... Uh, Previously, Balance made contact with his inner voice. Raljak needs his medicine. And Sultana enjoys a steak meal. Our inmates found themselves at the business end of a hangman's noose as they faced the law of dawn. The last we saw, blade, blood rain was falling from the sky upon their bodies. Are our inmates dead at the bottom of the gallows? Has Apocalypse really started? I guess we're about to find out. Welcome back to the Lucky Die. Yeah, that's before I very well established I'm going to have three questions, <laughs> which I feel much better about now. Was... Listening back to the unformatted, unfinalized version of intros makes me cringe. I wrote this one and I performed this live, inverted commas. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, you used to do these in uh, in front of the guys uh, in between yep. recordings. Yep. Uh, sorry. Yeah, very much so. Um, so I used to write them so that I wouldn't forget um, between the, to do them. Like I think I explained last time we did this, like the reason we do it so that the intro is fairly short. Um, it's not the world's best recap, but if you are binging, then hopefully it will help remember certain things. But yeah, this one... This one was done live. The next one for episode four was live. The one for episode five was done live. And episode five, I think, is the very last one that I did live. I think. Just going on memory that I think the next episode is Magic and Misdirection, which Demi turns up. And then everything just is chaos. So um, I think after that point. I look forward to doing that episode. (laughs) So let's just start with a really obvious big question first question which is why did you decide to hang the cast in your first episode um i think i explained this in the end of the other one um nope. we completely skipped over this i think really yep. um so the reason that i decided to have that coincide at the same time as the apocalypse is because well it kind of is the end of the world if you're you're being hung uh, so i thought it coincided perfectly with what should have happened um but there was a book series by Oh my God, Raymond E. Feist. And it's a part of a series like um, uh, Tales of a Merchant Prince, Shards of a Broken Crown, Queen of something, King of something. I don't remember exactly the name of the series, but one thing that stuck out to me was prisoners who were to be hung and they were exactly like our crew were, except some of them were saved i.e the rope was too loose and the ones that they wanted to hang were hung Um, and what happened was that they were then conscripted the ones that survived into a new unit that went and did some black ops shit um and that is exactly how they experienced it they had the hey you're dead um technically you're dead you hung for your crime um your soul now belongs to me um that kind of conversation and feel to them and i wanted these guys to have a very similar thing so that's kind of where i got the idea of like this crew of misfits murder well whatever crime they committed or i could get them hung for at the time uh so that would kind of be like how they got into this is how they got conscripted into helping out with the apocalypse is because their lives belong to someone else now they're dead like your your lives are not your own you're dead you've paid for your crime like that's it you're now conscripted and that's why i decided to do it and when when I described them walking up to the gallows, I generally got a knot in my stomach of like, oh my God, am I doing the right thing? Are they going to hate me after this? Are they just going to quit? And we're not, no, 150 episodes later, we're just like still doing this shit. So <laughs> it couldn't have been that bad. I did not prep them at all that this would be coming. Well, it did go really well. I, I, I <laughs> absolutely uh, think it's a really good uh, opening. And I think this is a good like little answer to, I think a lot of people make this assumption like, oh, they started in prison. This is a Bethesda uh, meme. 
mm-hmm. basically. Uh, but it's cool that you have the um, reference to like a, some literary history there. Yeah, like Romer D. Feist, like I really love some of the books he's written. Um, he wrote a series called Magician. And that is actually something that we've come across in some of the episodes that come out really recently, actually. Um, there's a magician and then the two follow-up books to that. And that actually references an island that has like an old, old school on it, housed by a very powerful magician. Um, it didn't quite come up in the episode as I'd intended. Like there were two islands that we've come across um, as we were traveling through the sea, one filled with sirens and the other one unknown. The unknown one is actually what happened um, when y'all arrived in Gita, when you found that town with like the school in it and the very powerful mage who began to like lose her mind a little bit like that was supposed to be on the second island that was a direct reference to another Raymond D. Vice work so you're a big fan I am actually I, I, I enjoy it like I haven't read lots of them and I haven't read them in years um so th- there's uh, there's to- those two series that he wrote and they're really like they're, I guess they're important to me. They're either Raymond E. Feist or David Gemmell, and I think it's Raymond E. Feist, I'm pretty sure. David Gemmell did, like, Legend, and I fucking love that book. That's where the name Kesa comes from, actually. Um, really? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> Legend. Legend is a whole thing, and I love that book, and I recommend anyone going to read it. But, yeah, like, specifically, lots of the references in TLD inadvertently have come from Raymond E. Feist's work. So. We all pull from, like where we like we we all use um how how do you phrase this like we all pull from like media we observe and consume yeah it 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 is the like um if you if you're a fan of something that person was probably a fan of something (laughs) and that person was probably a fan of something like it's always a never-ending stare that's right yeah so um one thing that i've seen a few people recommend that not a lot of people say that they do it but like they, they do is that it's sometimes difficult to start if like you hit that dry period of creating stuff is knowing what to do next and like how do i create something brand new and the simple answer is absorb new things like you will have new tales to tell if you listen to new mm. stories and they won't exactly be ha ha i've come up with something completely new by listening to this or i'm going to completely copy that no often they're just spark little ideas um i mean yeah. marnak came from looking at a character sheet and somebody saying i bet you couldn't so here we are um yeah, ab- ab- <laughs> absolutely. It's it's one of the probably biggest risks a lot of people take when they take their um, their creative process as jobs. Yeah, they stop having free time to do their little hobbies, and their hobbies yeah. was really what created the spark to begin with. I, I think a lot of people fall into that hole. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> too much coke on air. Um, <laughs> I mean, bubble, bubble. <laughs> So I used to do this thing where I used to take a month off, like usually somewhere August, September, where I just would stop doing social media stuff. I would stop talking to a lot of people. I'd stop going out. Not that I really went out a lot, but I would just absorb and read new things. I used to read a lot of fantasy novels. I don't so much anymore. I just don't have the patience. It doesn't give me the same joy as it used to. Um, And now I listen to like stories or i get audio books going or i just watch tv series and binge them for a while like i haven't had a month off to do that kind of thing in a while and it's probably telling a little bit like i'm slowly losing my mind and i probably need one of those but i highly recommend that yeah if you're trying to create and do something new just take time off just go this month i am absorbing stuff like this is all i'm doing i'm not writing creating and it's not a lot of people, especially if they do do creative stuff professionally as a job now, which is the, the dream, like, you know, Always. the dream TM. I'm moving my hand, not anyone can see that, Aether will later, but I'm moving my hand with the TM. Um, I consider it like. Element. <laughs> yeah, there's a video element to this. No one's going to see this, but Aether later. Um, <laughs> so, like, taking time off to absorb new stuff is not a waste of time, and most folks feel it is. You feel a, a pressure to keep creating, and if you're not creating, then you're not doing enough. Um, and I, I think that's bollocks. You need to take time off and absorb new things and listen to new stories, and that will help you with your storytelling later on. You always always learn something if you watch or listen to something new. Either that's very cool, or mm, that sucks. I'm never going to do that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one thing I want to reference the in uh, we'll, we'll get to it when we get to it um 
So getting back to the episode. Uh, sorry, <laughs> we're a no 10 minute ramble on something other than the beginning of the episode. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, it's, it's brilliant. It's, that's what the point of this is. It's about discussion. Uh, it, it's, if we were going to do a recap of the episode, <laughs> I wouldn't need, uh, we wouldn't need to be two of us. <laughs> One of us just would like make a, in a nutshell script. <laughs> I already did. It's the uh, previously on TLDs. <laughs> Good point. I, I think that people are going to lose a lot of context, but yes, that might work. Yes. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I have a note here just written down just at the very beginning of the episode, such vivid description. So you open the episode on some hardcore fucking descriptions. Um, you're describing them lying there, the, the, the tossing the rope around their necks and like they're just like lying in a pool of blood and mud. It's mm-hmm. a very fucking like upsetting imagery and I, I absolutely adore it absolutely adore it uh did you ever like worry about some of the imagery like uh i uh, the only time i ever really worried about it was actually all that pre-walk up to the gallo stuff it was that description that made me worry um it was that not the hurt describing the blood and the rope afterwards like that never even crossed my mind as a problem um i just hung them describing rope after that point seems a little bit moot <laughs> So, yeah, I, I was kind of after that. I'm like, okay, okay, we've gotten over the worst of some of the imagery that may or may not come up. So describing the rope and the blood and the mud and the gore, like it just goes to add to the fact that this is a yeah. shitty situation that we find ourselves in. It is the beginning of the apocalypse. So things are only going to get worse. And I have a quite a dark, twisted mind on occasions. Um, <laughs> so anything where I'm improvising, probably going to be going down that path eventually. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, did you do you know of the like? There's um. I th- I th- I don't know if it's a legend or if it's not, but it's called like the hangman's mushroom or something like that. There's like a um, a mushroom that is like legend to have like grown around where uh, hangman nooses were, because of like uh, bodily fluids that get expelled when you're hung. I haven't, but I have heard similar things like you know tales of laws and myth and all that good stuff about like um certain things that grow where folks have been buried um yeah. so like graveyards will have a certain type of lichen or a certain type of mushroom or like certain type of flowers that only grow there or like sites of great you know massacres um i've heard those kind of like law type things and i found them very interesting yeah uh I, I don't know like i was imagining them lying there and in my head i always add mushrooms to the bottom of uh, <laughs> hangman's gallows because it's just it's one of those things that just sticks in my brain that's cool yeah uh yeah and they, 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 they managed to not die. Uh, that's the opening of the episode. Yes. Um, I have in my notes that I keep trying to remind them that they are bound and that they have rope around them. And at one point they, they still, like, I think I mentioned it a few times and then someone's like, oh, I just say this, like, totally fine sentence. I'm like, no, you still have a rope around your neck. And thus begins Archie's... Awful, awful amazing, fucking voice. Amazing voice. It was that point I knew, yes, I have just hung them, but this still will never be a totally dramatic podcast. <laughs> I genuinely... <laughs> Humor in this. <laughs> I had to pause the podcast. It threw me off so much. I was just like, no, I, I don't it. like any of this. I loved it so much. It was such a way to kill the mood, though. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But that's needed. Like, uh, that's needed. <laughs> yeah, and they, they go for that cra- from that crazy voice to uh, Raul drooling on his rope. Yeah, so and... that's actually something Neil spoke to me about before we even started was, hey, can I use my acid in a way that isn't just a weapon attack? Can I use it to melt certain things or like create certain things? I'm like, I will draw the line at metal. Uh, other than that, go right ahead. Like we will figure it out in game. And that was what the, like I think one of the first times that actually really properly comes up. Yeah, uh, I think we proceed to see him do it in... Uh, well, less mechanic, more roleplay ways, but yes. a lot in the future. Yes, he does, yeah. And, like, yeah, I'm I'm always for encouraging, hey, if you've got a good RP reason that this happened, sure, go ahead. Like, there's no specifics written down. There's not a limit on the amount of acid you have. Um, like, the same way that I have, like, hey, if this is someone who is a master of, for example, like... I don't know, say electric magic, you know, the idea of sparking and shocking and weather. Like, you should be able to do really minor things. Like, hey, I'm going to think it's funny if my friend picks up that, like, metal fork and it's it just gives them an electric shock and I'm doing it because it's funny. Has yeah. no effect on the game other than roleplay. Sure, you should totally be able to do that. And, like, with Ral and his acid, like, yeah, 
like totally he should be able to do stuff like melt some ropes it would take time and it did i think cause him a little bit of damage i don't remember exactly but yes no, like those he, sort of things i'm totally fine with he proceeds to hurt himself on something else <laughs> oh yeah the manacles yep. yeah i've noticed about those too <laughs> <laughs> uh but uh as we move on the uh so on the gallows there were let me see um there were five people right yep fisty and liana were with them okay so fisty died but not the other one yeah so i decided that fisty's neck would just break like one of them would have the very typical death um yep. and it wasn't because as we keep joking later on in the series and i don't know if neil ever cuts them out i don't remember but it's fisty's fat ass that broke the gallows um it wasn't fisty's fat ass and that's not the reason that his neck snapped the reason his neck snapped is because i wanted him dead i wanted him to be like the cost of what happened at this point yeah. because i didn't have a story for him I, I have nothing beyond he was in prison he did some sex shady shit um and this is where he is this is where his life is now yeah, he's, um, a, he's a double one in prison you don't need to create more backstory than that exactly i mean i could if for example they had i don't know somehow pulled something ridiculous out of their butt and found a way to save him i, I don't know like i would have just rolled with the punches at that point i would have figured something out and made a story out for him a simple cool. speak with that like this is yep. the the danger of dnd uh it's the in, in in our mind the media we absorb that is in fantasy related death is the final like end and yeah D, &D has this really bad habit of allowing people to talk to dead people and you're like no that destroys my mysteries yeah uh which will come up later in TLD. yeah <laughs> yeah like speak with dead i think we actually only ever used once in tld so far um i'm um, actually surprised that we don't use it once i think it was tried a couple of times and you shoot it down because of how you do your afterlifes um possibly possibly but i only actively remember one coming up and that's in chat box um uh, i don't remember that one uh, oh it's uh it's the one where titus no his friend mm, trevor trevor yeah yeah trevor um performs a spell so that Raoul can speak with ama yeah and it come uh, it it gets revealed that uh once you're out of the stalking and into either bellum or cicero it becomes a lot more difficult for yeah, sure yeah borderline um, comes impossible yeah i, I, I um, don't remember the phrasing but like as a listener i i took away from that like stop trying <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i think i've mentioned this a few times in various places and i think i've mentioned it last time death in D, &D annoys the shit out of me um because one of the big impacts of doing stuff the big one of the bigger threats is death um but there's no finality um if yeah. you take away the impact that death has which is things are done this is a true cost and the cost is you know someone sacrificing themselves or someone doing something and it leads to resulting death um and the fact that D, &D basically negates that especially the higher level you get the higher level you get like you start getting vivify you can get raised dead like all those things become moot which yeah. means that sometimes you undo the sacrifices or those really telling emotional moments between friends where like hey this character knows they're gonna die but they're gonna stay behind and hold the door like that gets mooted because you can raise dead a couple of days later it's not a big deal i feel like it should be and i feel like it should be more difficult it adds more weight to the situation which is why i ended up bringing Soulfire into the game because i wanted a final point this is the end this is what death is this is this is a beyond this point um but i decided that you know hey we have a river fire i can't take that out of the game it's kind of important and it's a big plot point for some characters so yeah it gets brought up in uh, <laughs> sultana's backstory yeah um exactly um so, so it's 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 not like you you banned it you worked no. it even into somebody's story yeah i've i just warped it into a way that made me feel more comfortable with it which is why it has a sacrifice to do it like it has to be a big deal to do this um yeah. so that's part of the reason like a thousand gold diamond when you get to high levels means dick all as well so <laughs> so like that's not really a sacrifice is it um <laughs> yeah. uh, i th i think um within the um, context of D&D you can make it uh, good you ju you as a dm just kind of have to remember that and you have to remind everybody of it like uh, w what i'm trying to convey is like if somebody jumps in front of an arrow and goes down mm -hmm. uh, like don't portray it like if it's a level 7 party don't portray it as a as a heroic sacrifice it's a ah shit we 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 now uh, we're <laughs> now going to have to use the 1000 gold diamond yeah. like don't <laughs> yes. 
it's yeah. a minor setback. <laughs> yeah, if you remember that, but also remember the different rules for the thing. They have yeah. to have the diamond and they have to have the body. Yeah. And as you get higher levels, you have to have less and less stuff and more and more money. Yeah. Uh, but it is the... I don't remember what story I was reading, but they... There was a player that wanted to lose his character, so he had a temple fall on him. Uh, he talked to the DM, and he was like, I want my character to die, and I don't want it to be, like, a hand-wavy thing. <laughs> so, uh, he, like, there's a pillar that's going down, and he was playing, like, a strength character. Mm. And he, like, braces the pillar with his body and has the rest of the team run out, so, run out as the temple goes down. And it's, like, an underground thing, so his body just gets completely buried. Uh, and, yeah, you need a body to revive somebody. There's also the thing that you need uh, people's permission to be revived, but... Yeah, they have to be willing to be brought back. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there is also that. But, yeah, I... So, that's kind of why I wanted one of them to at least die. I mean, yeah. nobody was attached to Fisty and his fat ass, but, like, I wanted to make the point that at least one of them were dead. Um, yeah. And I left Liana... Excuse the... No, don't excuse the pun. Pun intended, hanging in that point. Um, because I didn't... I wanted to have... I had a vague plans that Liana might be something later on down the line. I left her in as a an extra plot hook that I could play with later on, and I have managed to make use of her now. Um, yeah. And we'll come back to that when that becomes relevant. Yes, that's the next thing in my notes, which is why I wrote it down. Oh, okay. You want to talk about it? <laughs> yeah. How much can you say? Uh, um, remember... Quite a bit, to be honest, because um, I think by the point this comes out... Anyway, it doesn't matter. I use Liana later on, um, and I think I even make, make reference to that before episode 150 anyway. Um, so Liana, I left her as a plot point and I was like, hey, I'm just going to leave her alive. I'm not going to mention her. I'm just going to say, hey, everyone hung. And I had ideas whilst recording this episode that she will probably escape. She might get out and um, she can maybe help break them free if they decide that they're going to do like a jailbreak in using the chaos in which to get themselves out of jail. Like, I will figure it out. She will be my rogue plot point. And as it was, I'm like... No, they've gone along with the plot. I'll just let her die. I'll just let her... I'll not bring it up again, and I'll just let her die, and she can just go off in the sun. And it's kind of my own oversight not to have mentioned her at the time, really, um, because Caden and Lindren definitely would be paying attention to all the people just hung, which would include Liana. <laughs> um, so yeah. I kind of should have brought it up, but my mind was already... 20 steps ahead of like oh i could use her for this or this or i could just let her die and we'll leave it to be a mystery um i shot myself in the foot i should have mentioned it mm, I, I like everybody i think everybody who listens knows there was a fifth person like in yeah. your mind you knew there was fisty and plus one fisty's plus <laughs> one uh so i think it works out fine uh though of course like anybody who's been listening like from a week to week basis since the beginning it's been three years it wouldn't be surprising if they yeah. forgot but as a casual listener from back then, I always imagined there were five of you, so... Yeah, that there was definitely always intending, like I say, I had Fisty just be, like, the casualty, and Liana was my, my rogue plot point. Like, I could do something with her later on. And I did that a lot, especially in the beginning episode, where I would throw pasta against the wall, and if things stuck, they stuck, and if not, I could reference back to them later. I may not have 100% figured out the plot for everything yet, mm -hmm. but I know that if I gave myself opportunities, I could reference back, and that would feel a bit more like a interwoven world yeah um, it's um as a dm you can retroactive a lot of stuff but yes. you have to have like you have to have thrown that pasta to begin with like mm -hmm. you need to it is imperative if you're running your own world to constantly make things and just leaving them yes uh, um sometimes they'll get picked up and sometimes they won't and if you're telling a really immersive interwoven story mm -hmm. sometimes you find oh shit i needed to have something back then yeah. and it feels a bit more like a real world if you're able to like hark back to things that they may have skipped over um i don't recommend doing it all the time because sometimes that can come and bite you in the butt especially if you're not prepared um like if they decided liana right in that moment was going to do something then shit between sessions i would have to write a shitload more about liana but as it was they decided to go save Caden instead so yeah uh i'll come to it but uh, the lead up to the dravos fight there's so much in that like i am shocked it hasn't been referenced more in uh where we are in the story at this point and it seems like it's not going to be referenced at all uh, uh dravos 
No, no, I, the lead up to Travis's fight. I, I, like I said, I was just going to gloss over this because I don't want to go into details. It's something <laughs> for a future episode. Okay. <laughs> um, so moving on, the you have Caden break his leg. That stuck out to me. Yeah, that was... Uh, I just wanted to show that there was damage happening all around them. Yeah. Um, that it was just, you know, guards were in turmoil, prisoners were in turmoil, like a lot of things have gone wrong. And yeah, I that was an improv of like, hey, yep, uh, something needs to have happened to Caden. He can't just be standing there. Everyone else is in turmoil. What am I going to do? Uh, he has a broken leg. That sounds great. Moving on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah, that was not planned. That was, that was me opening my mouth and figuring out shit as I went along. Um, yeah, and... Uh... Uh, oh, I have one note I'd really want to address just because I want to know if there's an answer to this. Sure. When Raul hurts himself while trying to unbind himself, <laughs> you yes. reference somebody being a dick to you. Yeah. Do you remember what you're referencing? I do 100%. So um, Arch and Casey and Neil and I and our friend Onyx used to play a game on a Saturday night. Saturday night for them three in the morning on a Sunday for me or something ridiculous. Um, okay. So, yeah, we, we used to play a and d game on a Saturday night and Arch DM'd it and I was playing a monk because I was challenged that monks are boring and all they do is punch. I'm like, <laughs> bring it on, motherfucker. Um, and my character was manacled at one point. Um, DM Fear, hey, you're manacled. So I tried literally everything to break out of them. I slid my hands underneath myself. I used bits and pieces that were hanging on the wall. I tried to flex out of them. And every time I failed, I would take damage because that's just how that was in that particular game. Um, and obviously with Ral and Nat wanting himself, we had like played this game like probably a couple of weeks before, I think it was. So that was just a very natural accidental reference to what that was. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, we have that. And then you have the team kind of running around trying to help people, trying to get themselves un, uh, unmanacled. Yeah, well, this is interesting um, because Zoltana, I didn't see it and I didn't remember it at the time. I didn't pick up on it. But um, Lafian's instinct is to help Caden. So he wants to go over and help him and send Zoltana. And Zoltana doesn't want to help. She wants to be helped. <laughs> she wants to get out of her manacle. She doesn't care about Caden in that particular moment. In that particular moment, she wants to be free of her manacles. I'm like, oh yeah, I'd forgotten she was a little bit more like mercenary fuck youism at the very beginning. I missed that. I've oh, forgotten yeah. that. Oh yeah. And uh, you have uh, Sultana healing Caden's broken leg. Yeah. Uh, and then you have uh, Arch run over Arch. Uh, you have Lafian. Balance. We have balance, run over and heal <laughs> Kaithia. And uh, that's the first time Arch uh, voices that his character can do healing magic and he like, kind of plays into it. And I, yeah. I appreciate that role play. Yeah, I, I appreciate the leaning into that. And it was a good way for me to start voicing the idea that psychics and magic are very different. Um, yeah. I I have not made no secret of this. I am not a fan of having things like mystics and psychics and warforged. And I am going to break the meta of this game and I'm going to stick to the meta of this. Like, I don't like that. I think it's really unbalanced. Excuse the pun. Um, I think it's really unbalanced and it's not great. Um, you just hate anything non-Tolkien. Um... Well, back then, yes, because I was very uncomfortable with those other things. Like, I didn't get why you would have all these extra things, and I wanted to keep something accessible. Like, a lot of people know no Lord of the Rings, and that is, like, your dwarves and your rails and your gnomes and all your good shit. Um, like, people know that stuff. Um, so I wanted to keep it accessible at that point and then expand out as we went. But things like psychics have no counter. There's no proper balance to them. Um, like, uh, for example... Uh, fighters can be restrained and that stops them being able to hit magic users can have silence or counter spell um, nullifying that mystics can yeah there you go um, so there's no counter to it and I think that's very unbalanced um, yeah. they are fragile but they also have a bunch of extra stupid abilities at the end but I've basically had to boil it down to hey it's some sort of wizard with some of the um, sorcerer's meta magic of not having to like speak or use components or do any hand gestures so he's just constantly a, a, a sorcerer with that activated and it's annoying but yeah <laughs> it's what Arch wants to play and it's made a good ass character and I've managed to build that into the lore of the world so yeah like it probably yeah. all for the best I think you've absorbed it very properly into the world and I think it works out real well thank you um 
uh, we then have Lindren kind of decide to like kind of pick up the crew, and uh, you have him like praying at one scene. Yes, uh, and uh, you have him like <laughs> take everybody back in. And I, I, I have just a note here. Just says Ral still really standoffish. It's yes. uh, when he gets back into the like when he gets le- let in, he's still like shackled, and the rest of them have gotten themselves unshackled, and he's just like, like I'm covered in blood. Fuck off! I, I, I don't care. Like, stop talking to me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's very much like, especially these beginning episodes, I think it's probably up until about they hit Chatbook, um, that they are still very standoff with each other, like, they're forced into this situation, um, and I love the fact that they are still that at those very beginning episodes, like, yeah, 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 Raoul is still very much, fuck you, fuck everything, fuck this, why me, and I I, kind of miss a bit of Raoul doing that, Um, but I'm glad that they have evolved to a place where everybody kind of gets on now. I find that so much easier to deal with. We had uh, Neil on uh, AMA recently, and he told us that um, when he started playing Raul, his intention was that whatever Raul gets fed, he feeds into back. Like, yeah. So if you're mean to Raul, Raul is mean to you back. And uh, according to Neil, at least at the time, he said that like basically, like if people were gonna try to take advantage of him, he was just gonna do it back. Right. Yes. That, that was his character, and he was just gonna. Um, let like the the world and the players create his own character around themselves. Yeah, so he he wanted like the idea um, mostly because if people are mean to him, he's going to be mean back as a defense mechanism. Mm-hmm. If people are good to him, he'll let them in and he'll be more than good to them in return. Like that was his idea, and we had a lot of conversations back and forth of like, oh no, what if the characters don't do this? Or hey, how are we going to deal with this? Everyone keeps being dicks to each other. I'm like. You'll figure it out, and it's development. Like you will all figure this out. You'll get there. I have faith in the three of you to make this work, and they did. Um, yeah. I was very happy with that. And you can actually see it when Squash turns up. He's such a dick to Squash. Oh, yeah. It's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I think we have the last instance of Linden. In... Yes, I think so. It might be the last instance of in- Linden. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thanks for continually mocking me on that. Either. I will not stop <laughs> until you stop calling him Linden. I also think this is the point where I actually settle on Raul Jack rather than Raul Jack. Ah. I don't know. My brain still. I, I still can't. Um, there was a running. Oh my god, has this been released? I don't know. I'm not sure what you're referencing right now. Uh, true names. Oh no! This episode like one sixty-seven. Okay, then I can't talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> Next episode. Next time, moving on. Sorry, moving on, moving on. All right. Uh, so yeah, you have uh, Lindrin drag them in there, and mm-hmm. he's uh, doing his proclamations of like. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I wanted to mention this. Uh, first time I listened to the podcast. I couldn't follow the logic that Lindrin was going for. And now that you explained it's kind of like a thing that you read in a book, I'm like, that does hit like a, like, this feels like some kind of lofty logic you read in novels. Yes. That sometimes happens. It's it's that, like, I was supposed to execute you, and I technically did until God stopped me. <laughs> so now is... you belong to me. And it's like... That is exactly his thought process. It was exactly where that came from. It's like, gods themselves have nullified your execution. But if I let you go... I might be executed by Empress Appella. So I'm going to say your lies belong to me and they will end when they end. Cough. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and uh, I, I was going to mention that. Uh, it's just funny that you already kind of answered the mm. answered the question that I had, which was <laughs> like, where does this logic come from exactly? Yeah. It, it always struck me as a... As a like. <laughs> Calling it wrong or weird is like unfair. It is just that kind of like fantasy logic that you sometimes hear. Yeah, um, that that was very much very much the idea around that is that yeah, like your lives belong to me now. Like you're dead. You have no use for your lives. You're dead. They're mine now. And that was very much like that roundabout knowledge he had to use. But obviously, I had to do it from a guy who's just witnessed the apocalypse, yeah. who is thinking of this on the spot and how to save his job, um, and not go against. Obviously, the world counselling out at least their deaths. So, yeah. Uh, And Lindgren goes on to claim that he's not religious, yet he thinks this might be an act of God. Like, what are you... What is Lindgren thinking in that moment? Like, what are you... Um, So, it's just one of those things that you sometimes just observe is, like, the people with their backs against the wall will sometimes pray. 
um, not religious, don't believe too much in God, maybe agnostic. But when push comes to shove, sometimes you experience things and you go, right, I I have to, I, I, I what have I got left? I'm going to pray. That's what I've got. Um, and that was very much lingering in that moment. Like, yeah. I've had those moments. Yeah, okay. Um, makes sense. You just wanted to pray, portray a character um, having that moment. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, were you pulling from your own life in that moment? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I haven't seen blood rain from the sky. <laughs> and what, I, you missed that? <laughs> I missed that particular instance um you know i've 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 had some rough stuff um i've had some rough stuff happen and yeah it's been that i've got nothing left there there is nothing else to save this moment there's nothing else to do this and yeah i've had that shit what is there left well i'm gonna i'm gonna shout into the void and see if anyone hears me and the answer was nothing heard me so <laughs> at least lindron had the gods i had fuck all <laughs> so i just wanted to show that um yeah. What what do you think agnotism looks like in the world of TLD? Like people know that gods exist. They ex- observe paladins performing mil- mil- miracles. Yeah. Yeah. And... Well, it's kind of different, isn't it? Like to know that the gods exist means that agnostics aren't quite the same as they would be in our world. Um, like we believe there probably is something and they know that there is, but they don't ascribe to any particular um, deities. They don't go, oh, okay, yeah, Tyr himself will have this justice for me, or like the god of agriculture shall guide my path as I you know, plant seeds. No, they're just like, I'm gonna carry on with my lives and the gods are gonna do what the gods are gonna do. Um, some of them get really friendly with the gods and become paladins or got called into service like clerics or demand power like warlocks. Other folks just continue on with their lives. Um, gods interfere the same as i don't know like our politicians interfere so like that's kind of it really <laughs> yeah uh so in this scene lindren just goes on and on and on he's uh um, it's you setting up a base uh, basically the story yeah um or at least the setting of the yeah, kind of their framework for how like hey this is this is the framework for how you're gonna like this is the idea of how this is gonna work and then when it doesn't work out we'll figure it out um yeah it's just setting up the framework mostly yeah and lindren has some uh choice words i i enjoy them very much uh i can't keep having my fun if the apocalypse comes <laughs> oh yeah yeah lindren's a dick <laughs> <laughs> that, that, those are the words of a fucking lunatic. Yes. <laughs> uh, oh, I'm I'm enjoying my time here on Earth. If the apocalypse comes, that will stop me and my fun time. It's that like... that actually is not exactly a word for word quote, but it is the same feel that I get from um, Buffy. And there's a character in there called Spike, and. Uh, I think it's the end of season three, I think it is, where Angel goes off the deep end, or season two, I don't remember exactly. Um, And Angel is trying to summon something that will destroy the world, and Spike is a vampire, but he doesn't want the end of the world, because at the moment he can go have happy meals on people and snack on whoever he wants. When the end of the world comes... There is no snacking upon people. There is nothing. And that's not good for them either. Um, So that's kind of what I feel Lindren is in that moment, is like, hey... I don't want the end of the world, but I also kind of want to keep living my life. So can you just deal with this? Um, that's that's Lindgren. <laughs> All right. Uh, then there was, uh, let me see. Oh, yes. I, I don't know why I absolutely adored this like f- uh, ramble here, but uh, Lindgren is like trying to convince or argue with them. And he basically, I, I think Sultan is basically like annoying him a lot in that yeah. moment. And he goes, you, I don't get on. Uh, you, okay. Let me see. Uh, let me <laughs> let me start from the beginning. You and I don't get on. You and I don't get on. And frankly, I hate you, Dragonborn. Yeah. That, like, singling out Raal is so <laughs> fucking like. It gives his character so much like, like it it changes Lindrin from like evil warden who just hates his um um his his inmates or whatever mm-hmm. you want to call them uh, into like a like a kind of a like oh he he's got levels of hate for his inmates mm-hmm. and he desperately hates Ralph for some reason yeah um that also kind of harks back to a conversation we had with Neil before we started which is that he wanted like prison to be particularly rough for Ralph 
um, mm-hmm. especially being that he's kind of the only dragonborn in town now. And so far as everyone's concerned, he killed the only other dragonborn in town who seemed to be like a nice lady. So um, <laughs> Lindrum was just on a warpath and just absolutely hated him. And also the part that Raoul kept drooling acid everywhere and destroying all of his clothes. Like he would have many reasons to be pissed off at Raoul. So that's kind of where that came from, really. And also, you know, Lindrun does have levels of annoyance at people. Like he can tolerate Caden, even though he's a super nice guy and that rubs him the wrong way because he knows that Caden is useful in this situation. Doesn't like Zoltana because, well, he doesn't like many of his prisoners and Zoltana is a double one in his eyes and they're all scum. And then you have Lafian who's basically holidaying in the prison and getting away with whoever he wants because he's a prince. Uh, like that also pisses Lindrun off. <laughs> so <laughs> it's levels of annoyance with this guy. <laughs> I always imagine Lindgren's annoyance with um, with balance came from the like, what's the word I'm looking for? Like powerlessness he felt around balance. It was like, oh, I got an inmate and I don't have a choice. Like, yeah, it, it comes from his real annoyance of him is that he is getting like he's basically hiding. Yeah. Um, like this guy is hiding away. They have to acquiesce to some of his demands. He can't do exactly wants because he still has to bear in mind that they're part of the dusk at the time. Like yeah. there are still those aspects, and like he jumps on that ability when um, Appella takes over as part of the dawn to like, hey, I can now rid myself of all of these things. And also, it's the law. Um, so yeah, yeah. Um, and then Lindgren proceeds to give them their mission. Uh, yeah, which is very lofty. Yep. And it is very big. <laughs> it's it's a man on the edge of trying to figure out how the hell to save his job. <laughs> and by keeping the goals big, then you can keep them around longer. <laughs> and he sense. doesn't know exactly what the apocalypse is or how it's happening or, or any idea that it's related to them at all. So, Yeah. Uh, so he, the task he gives them, I don't have it written out exactly the phrasing he does, but it is... <laughs> Find out what's causing the apocalypse and stop it. Yeah, yeah. It's a pretty simple job, really. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Eight days worth of content later, still trying to find it. <laughs> and then uh, Lindrin uh, zooms in on the fact that they have like a slight like companionship with Caden and decides mm-hmm. to shackle Caden to them. Yeah. Uh, which is a very like kind of interesting scene because you can kind of... You can hear their hesitation, the players' hesitation, because they're like, he, like, 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 I think you can hear their meta brain going like, we don't know or care about Caden. He's existed for two hours, V. Like, there is that, I think, meta part of their brain that is like, like, what do you what? think you're doing? I, I can't honestly ascribe to that. Um, Like, I think as I mentioned before, like, Neil created Kate. Well... Neil created the bare bones of Caden and I, I fleshed him out and um, Arch had also mentioned about maybe having a guard that he was familiar with and I'm like great I can give you a name for that already Neil's given me something go for it and obviously I hadn't told him that Neil had given to me just that hey there is this guard his name is Caden you know him so I would kind of managed to work him into at least two of their kind of situations all their yeah. information beforehand and Casey actually also says it in character hey you have kids that wasn't in the notes it's a direct reference to the fact that Caden in their notes did not have children <laughs> did oh. not have a family <laughs> oh, I- Right, right, right. Okay, so I, I may be reading a little bit into that because I like I find the energy in that scene where Lindgren's like, yes, yes, I can tie your feet <laughs> together. Uh, somebody owes me a favor down in the witch society. Me, uh, yeah, like, yeah. I, I, like, in that moment, I felt the energy in the group was a little bit weird, but maybe they were just trying to figure out what the fuck you were talking about. They're like, what do you mean bind their face to Caden? What the fuck you want? If he dies, we die. If we die, he dies. I'm like, no. Maybe not make it that bad. Maybe I figure I'll figure out something else. Yeah. I'll write down the meta between the episodes. It's fine. Um. And uh, at this point, uh, at some point, uh, Lindren has done enough to annoy Arch to the level Ooh, that yeah. he decides that Balance is going to start mind thrusting him. Oh yeah. And I- <laughs> so, were you expecting it to take three hours for Arch to start murder hopo murder hopoing your NPCs? Um, I didn't expect them to, but I also did not not expect them to. If that kind of makes sense, I'm like, yeah. mm, it makes sense. It also like listening back is kind of disturbing. <laughs> 
because <laughs> it is that first instance of real murder hobo that we have in the series um yep. and it comes from Lafian of like hey i'm gonna kill this guy without moving um huh, aren't i cool and it's like oh no that's super disturbing if you think about it like hey he gets a few minutes and the first thing he does is try to kill a guy just because he's a dick Ooh. um i'm glad he's i'm hoping he's evolved beyond that but we'll never know because lindron is a dick and everyone has a right to see him dead um so yeah. i can't like i can't discourage that um but yeah I, I think i think at least Lafion has evolved a little bit from that point yeah, yeah, um yeah. not just murder hobering and i think everyone's definitely past that point but yeah, I didn't expect it quite so early, but also I get it. It is Lindren. Um. Yeah, and uh, from a um, tactical point of view, it kind of makes sense because Lindren is just about to send them out on their own. Yeah. And he would be the only person they have to answer to. So mm-hmm. taking care of him would kind of be like a real nice way to just get your like threats cut and just be free. <sighs> Yeah, um, there, there will always be that nice option there if that had managed to work out, but I wasn't going to let him die. Uh, yeah, I have that in my notes a little bit later. Like, <laughs> so did, did like as uh, uh, like I'm we're skipping a little bit, but like at the end of the scene, um, Lindren's like kneeling over and he's like uh, like like he's he's, he's supporting himself <laughs> against like doors yeah. and walls and people. Were you gonna like? Were you writing down the damage he was doing? Yes. And were you going to let him kill Lindren? Um, I was basically like, okay, if he does what I feel like to be a significant amount of damage, I will let Lindren pass out. Mm-hmm. He will have the same mechanics as they do because he's the warden and he should have way more health than them, which he yeah. did. Um, and he should go unconscious like they do. Like any important NPC, he gets unconscious and not dead. Um yeah. <laughs> He's also a person, and I think murdering someone in the third episode probably not a good look for Lafian. <laughs> so I would have allowed him to go unconscious, but I wouldn't have allowed him to be dead um, because I think that would have been a step too far. All right. Uh, but if they had decided to go down the murder hobo route, then I guess the alternative universe version of hey, this is I'm not guessing the evil campaign, but like yeah, Caden would not have been on board with that, so they would have lost that thing there. Caden doesn't know shit. If, Lindra just had an aneurysm and fell down. Yeah, if you don't think that that wouldn't have come back to bite them in the ass, yeah. then they're living on cloud nine. Always, um, always. But maybe this is a good point for AU version of TOD. This is the exact moment. <laughs> that is an interesting idea. Um, <laughs> Check out the big brains on me. I'm a genius. <laughs> So uh, before Lindren passes out, or before he gets to that point, yeah. there's a really good interaction between um, um, Balance and Lindren, where Balance just kind of straightforward, like, real talk, man, do you believe in the greater good? <laughs> and I think the little spiel that Lindren gives is real good. Yeah, that's, that's especially back then, that's my take on the world, really. Like, Lindren, it's awful to say, but Lindren's attitude in that moment is the closest any character is to me. Which is like, you know, there is no good and evil, they're all arbitrary bullshit um, decided by time and whatever is going on. And people are either dicks or they're not. And that basically depends on your perspective. Um, everyone has a different view on stuff and... Yeah, dicks and non-dicks, good, um, good evil, uh, sorry, greater good and, and um, you know, the bigger evil plot. Like, as far as Lindren's concerned, like, yeah, people are just people. Like, you can ask, you can give them one of, the, one of these two tags, but at the end of the day, your interactions with them, that's what forms it. And that's, that's pretty much Lindren's mindset. Um, he sees a lot of shitty people in this world, probably in the wrong profession if he wanted to change his mind, but I think he kind of enjoys what he does. So he's never going to stop being around assholes. Yeah, I, I think he's chosen his lot in life. <laughs> yeah, he's he's settled on being a dick. Yeah. Oh, he's uh, like kind of a walking uh, example of the stare into the abyss and the abyss stares into you kind of thing. Yeah, pretty um, much, yeah. Um, he, he decided to surround himself with inmates at all times, and then he's like, why is the world so bad? Yes, like, yes, he's done this to himself um yeah. i would like to have a point out the rest of lindra's tech uh, no, not me it's just that one phrase that one sentence like you di- you're a dick or you're not a dick that's 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 my yeah. world point not the rest of it oh, the rest oh, of lindra can fuck off you're, you're not okay asshole. with abusing prisoners no and- 
brilliant. Uh, there's no, no. I, I feel like take... I need to say this in case anyone takes this the wrong way. You don't take no. glee in the idea of capital punis- punishment. No, I, no, man. I'm not getting into that. Just no. <laughs> All right. Uh, and then we, of course, have the fucking greatest fucking line from Sultana. Uh, yep. Dick, what is it? Eh. Eh. Uh, I hate to tell you this. Nah, I don't hate to tell you this. You're a dick. You're a dick, 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 dick. It's just the funniest shit. It's a great fucking moment. Lindgren and Caden, I just have a question for both of you. Okay. To see my curiosity. Do you believe in the greater good? You see Lindgren smile and he says, I believe that people are just who they are. No good, no evil, just dicks and non-dicks. Dicks and non-dicks, eh? Well, uh, hate to tell you this, Lindren, but, uh, you're a dick. <laughs> Actually, no, I don't hate to tell you that. I love to tell you that. You're a dick, you're a dick, you're a dick. Yeah, I, I love that so much. Um, I, of course I should have seen it coming as soon as I opened my mouth and I used the phrase, you're a dick or not a dick. Of course I should have seen that coming. Yeah. But my brain wasn't there. It's just the, you're either an asshole or you're not. Um, so You would, set yourself up for that one. I did. This is my fault. But it didn't come, I didn't plan that sentence. I didn't plan any of that to come out. That's a direct result of, of Arch as laughing, as a balance, like challenging the two people around him. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, then once they leave um, <laughs> uh, Lindren's office after he almost passes out the group recognises the evil monologue <laughs> I have to make a big shout out to Arch and Casey for that bit I, oh sorry I didn't recognise that as an evil monologue please continue <laughs> that, like I listened back to that just now and it just made me laugh really hard it is, it is. um Sorry. Um, yeah, I found it kind of interesting that Raul tries to uh, talk Caden out of the binding. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, I, again, like my brain's going like, what are they? What is the end goal in this moment for the players? Um, I think the end goal for Raul in that moment is to not have his only friend drawn into something that is clearly a big problem. Yeah, yeah, of course. With all the um, backstory work that yeah. Raul did with Caden, of course he doesn't want Caden to be put into harm's way literally in episode three. It's like, no, 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 no this, this is like episode 30 stuff that you should start threatening Caden. Nah. Like once we've gotten a staff list and shit, you shouldn't be threatening him in episode three. Episode two, I hung you, I start the apocalypse. Episode three, start threatening Caden. Go big or go home at this point. <laughs> Uh, and you then proceed to have Caden show off some magic. Uh, oh, yeah, I have a note about that. Um, yeah. So I've tried to make sure that green flames, green fire is strictly kept to soul fire. But that development didn't happen until probably 20 episodes later when I figured out exactly how soul fire was going to work. I'm like, it's just going to be green. And I'd forgotten I'd put it on his blade. <laughs> so <laughs> that's me fucking up. If anybody asks in character, I will bullshit something up. But to this point, I'm just going to hope nobody brings it up in character. <laughs> you used to play a lot of World of Warcraft, right? Yes, I did, yeah. Do you think that's where your brain gra- grabs the... It was 100% where ah! that came from. <laughs> I got you. Fucking 100% where that came from. I love the fact that warlocks have green fire. I fucking love it. And I think that they made a, a change fairly recently or around the time... That this was coming out or a year or so before where they changed warlock fire to orange and i lost my mind you had to go buy a special rune to make the fire green again at least that's how i remember it and it just annoyed me so i made sure he had a green flame blade um, so you were just ranting on forums on the on the internet like <laughs> ah they ruined my childhood no no see i never played a warlock because i couldn't get hang of the fucking curses i'm a healer by nature so like i couldn't deal with this but i was just like no it sucked um yeah so I'm hoping that nobody ever asks why Caden has a green flame sword in character because my answer will be, shit, I'll have to make something up. Your answer will be, listen to the second episode of Beyond the Eclipse. <laughs> yeah, where I would just freely admit, yeah, I just I didn't have Soulfire nailed down at that point. I didn't realise it's only going to be green flames for that and that's where I'm going to keep this green fire. Um, yeah, this is, this, is, this is a minor slip up that I will have to somehow retcon or talk my way around. I will figure it out. <laughs> I don't think you need to worry about it. I think everybody recognizes uh, <laughs> first three episodes. Like, like yeah, like in the first three episodes, you have people take damage on a critical failure. It's like this never comes really back. It's, 
we're all finding our feet to the early game. It's always like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we'll we'll get there. I'll figure something out, but mm. yeah. Like I'll I'll figure something out if it ever comes up. So yeah, the green flames. No oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> And then you proceed to have the characters uh, go get their stuff from uh, holding or yep, whatever that's you right, want to yep. call it. So and that's the room that they kind of get moved into. So it's just a room with a kind of desk in it with a bunch of cages and boxes, which I never settle on the word of. I always say cages or boxes or caskets or or like b- b- um, something else. I never settle on the word and I keep what seeing in my brain cages. were you envisioning? Cages. I, I saw cages. What I saw cages, cages with like, boxes in it. <laughs> like cages like you would have like, like you imagine like animals and fantasy movies are always in like no the metal no top and metal bottom than bars no um so just kind of like um you know like lockers um yes. like you would just put your shoes in them yeah. just just a cage without a front to them and they would have boxes in them and they have items in them like it wasn't anything massively secure because this isn't exactly a big prison it's just a prison um and to be fair i still hadn't had an exact map of this but i didn't have a map of this place until we we recorded um uh, soap opera. So. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. The 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 official title is soap, soap opera. opera. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I had the um, working title. What was it? Alternative beginnings. Yeah, alternative beginnings. Yeah. Um, is what we had. Um. So yeah, like I didn't have a map until then, but yeah, I just envisioned like basically cages with no fronts to them. You keep saying cages. You mean lockers. Um. So I when I envision cages, I see metal bars like the yeah. ones that you would, like you would use for like um moving animals um like just those just without fronts to them and just stacked up with boxes or hoodies or jackets or whatever whatever is in it um, okay. just shoved in there all right and i wanted to just give you like fucking props on the idea of the um, like you don't like of course the players do this to a certain extent but you don't just hand them a character sheet and tell them like your inventory is in here here you go <laughs> like you as a dm engage the players it's the same thing as when you had them come out of the prisons one at one one yeah. by one and you had to describe their characters and what they were up to and stuff like that this time you t- t- like tell them here's your cage here's your box and what's in your box and yeah um, that kind of comes to something that, uh, funny enough, it's not exactly directed by my father, but he, uh, I used to stream a lot with a buddy of mine and he used to listen to it and he's like, I really hate it that I don't know what's in your inventory. I don't know what this candle does, yada, yada, yada. And he used to get really annoyed about it. And I just saw this moment as a good place to go, okay, this is technically where your character is completed. Like you do your character creation first, you do your stats and then you put your gear on your character sheet. And this is like the completion of the character. This is, hey, we finished this part where you are stuck in jail. We've now completed that part. You now also get your gear and that is that also completed. So there's the parallel going together there. So I wanted them to say what was in their character sheet because I try to make it a habit of never checking anyone's character sheets when we're playing. Because I, as a DM, I like being surprised by the stupid shit you'll bring up. Um, I have this item for 400 episodes ago. Do you remember this tiny icon which scared away spiders? I did not remember you had that when I designed a spider encounter. Um, so, yeah, I like being surprised those things. And I wanted from the start not to have too much control or look too frequently on what character sheets have what. Um, so I wanted them to explain what was on it, not just for myself. So I could like, oh, yeah, they have a bedroll, make sure they, um, the essentials. But also so that the audience could hear what it was that everybody had. So I just wanted them to do that. Yeah. Uh, and I have a little bit of notes about the boxes. Um, first of all, just so much props for how you describe uh, Balaz's box. Thank you. Like, you clearly thought through Balance's, um, like, inmate history when you created this scene. Mm-hmm. And you didn't lose a moment to put some real world flair to it. Uh, now, of course, it's a little bit like not ruined or tainted. Those are bad words. But like the eloquence of the scene is pulled away when the players go, eh, how long have you been here? I don't know, about 50 years. <laughs> it's like, guys, like the world was talking. You can shut the fuck up. <laughs> so uh, I guess I guess I will accept the props you have for pre-planning. I did not pre-plan that. Um, that box was completely on the fly. Well, then props to your <laughs> brain for really, really good improv. Uh, yeah, I didn't have a description for his box. I just realized that after I'd let everyone go to it that, 
oh shit, his box would be different, right? He His would be covered in dust. It would not have his name on it because they're trying to hide it. And most of that was me stumbling my way through it. Of like, oh shit, his would be different, wouldn't it? It sounds um, natural and it comes off like super well pre-planned. Yes, and I appreciate that's, it. That's good. Um, I was definitely... There was a lot less notes back in those days. <laughs> Not just like world notes were fucking huge, but there were a lot less general notes as we gone through. So there was a lot less for me to remember. So odd things like that were things that I could remember. Like, oh shit, I forgot to do this and to do it on the fly. Now doing things like that would mean I'd have to go back and read through a bunch of notes to have like a good description or a good idea on what that would be. Um, but yeah, that's just more wrapping up of like, hey, your character is now complete. Here's all your shit. Um, yeah. And then we have Neil proceed to confuse the shit out of me by calling his hoodie a jacket. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That, that that genuinely infects my notes into next episode <laughs> where I'm like, what fucking jacket is this? I have notes like talking about this. And then like around episode five, my brain puzzles pl- together like, oh, oh, he's talking about his hoodie. Like, yes. For some reason, he's calling it a fucking jacket. Yeah, we, we do that back and forth a little bit until we're like hey we remember this is a hoodie right <laughs> like this is a hoodie has a pouch in the front like has a hood <laughs> isn't zipped up the front it's just a hoodie right <laughs> and I-, I genuinely do appreciate that neil like when when neil was trying to get out of the manacles and he fails he remembers like i failed to get out of the manacles then they're walking towards lindren office and he's like i'm still in manacles and people are like why haven't you been unlocked and he's like i don't know guys why haven't i been unlocked <laughs> and then he proceeds to go to the 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 cage office room and as everybody's getting their shit neil's just like i can't do anything what was the phrasing i don't have hands <laughs> That's it, yeah <laughs> and he can hear casey just go like what what? I thought he was talking about having talons or claws. I'm like, yeah. that makes sense, but there's still your hands, dude. Um, and he's like, the manacle together. I'm like, oh my god, I can't believe I'd forgotten to unmanacle him. I'm such a and moron. It's just funny because like he he was probably the only one who hyper focused on trying to get out of his manacles, <laughs> yeah. while everybody else just kind of got unlocked. <laughs> it was just dragged out. It was very mm-hmm. very silly. Mm-hmm. I did think that was really funny. It was, and um, then we have um, them leaving the. Uh, leaving the prison for nope, the first time. they do not leave the prison. They get locked inside that room. Was I not listening to the episode and they ended on like a little song? That might be the end of episode four, but the end of episode three, they get locked back in that room. They get locked in the room that they get taken into. Oh, yeah. So they get taken into the room where all the things are stored because it has a lock on it and they need to get their stuff anyway. So that's why Lindren takes them in there. And Caden closes the door and says like hopefully this is for the final time right right okay sorry my brain um skipped episode four uh yeah i think it's in the beginning of episode four you do a really good in- a description of um them leaving the prison for the first time uh that's the beginning of episode five the episode four is magic and misdirection where i bind them inside that room and there, i bind them inside that room and i remember binding them inside that room because demi accidentally sets fire to a bunch of shit in the cages and they're like what the fuck is going on um all of that who the hell is this is in episode four all right, all right. um i also think the end of magic and misdirection i think is the kythea reveal uh let me see my notes yep yep which means i think the beginning of episode five is Lafian learning of so maybe it'll be episode six that they leave mm. okay i don't remember but no, yeah, the end of episode three is where Caden locks them into the room with all of their things because it's a secure room. Um, okay. And they're going to need access to the stuff and he's hoping that he can find them a place to stay so that they don't have to stay there overnight and that's what he focuses on basically for the rest of the time that he's not around because he doesn't want them locked in there. He believes in Rao's innocence. He thinks he knows about Lafian's situation He's not entirely sure what's going on with Zoltana, but clearly whatever saved her has saved her. So he's going to give it a shot and it's kind of too late by that point anyway. Um, And I wanted that cinematic kind of... You see it a lot in TV shows where the end of an episode is the closing of a door, which means this is the closing of a chapter. And for me, I wanted that as well because this should have been the last time that I locked the door on them. I think I do it a few times afterwards. But my intent was this is the last time that they have the door locked on them. This is the last time that they're going to be locked inside a prison cage. This is the completion of their characters where they get all their gear and all their most of their abilities back. Um, 
So yeah, I kind of wanted this to be the end of that, to be that very cinematic clang, door close, end of an episode. So that's hmm. kind of why that happened this way. It's pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah, and we have like a little tune that Neil made for us at the end of the episode. Yeah, and it's beautiful. Yeah, then we uh, transition to the next episode. Neil Neil just fucking elevates anything he puts music under. Yeah, like, we... I will stumble around and it kind of like, yeah, you get that, that kind of moment sometimes when I do this kind of spieling talk about what the end of a thing or beginning or intro or whatever it is, whatever description or whatever I'm babbling about. And then Neil puts music underneath it and it's like, holy shit, that has impact. Neil, goddamn, you genius. Um, it always had impact. It's <sighs> music elevates and amplifies. Music is a cheat code to emotions. I think it's yeah. Well, it is a cheat code to emotions. But sometimes, like when you're recording and you listen back to a recording, you often can't pick up and you can't feel whatever energy is at the table. It's just a side effect of not being there in the moment of it yeah. being edited. And I think when Neil puts music underneath it, holy shit, it often brings that back and makes it like so much more poignant like actually just uh i'm gonna i'm gonna uh, everybody knows i love neil so I, i'm gonna continue this and I, I don't give a shit um but there's an episode where um i'm gonna use a really a fairly recent one actually um there is the one where squash is having his nightmares after going on a drug-induced magic-induced nightmare fuel god's dream bullshit and there is a moment between him and demi when she appears back on the ship and there is a really long pause in real life it is probably four or five times longer than what neil actually cut it down to and he puts music underneath it and i just felt my heart race like i did at the time like i was feeling very nervous because i knew this was coming up i thought knew shit about it but i knew this moment was coming up blindsided yeah completely i'm like yes yes blindsided you do twice in the same episode fuck yeah um anyway so there was the moment when on the boat and i i could feel my heart beating like really pounding and going for it and the nervousness that demi has is is my nervousness because i didn't know how to handle it um, but i knew it had to happen and i listened back to it without the music and it's like oh yeah this is pretty good and I'm, i maybe make the pause a little bit longer and then he put music back underneath it and listening to it i got exactly those feelings back so neil is a master of catching and reiterating those and in that moment where we had the door shut on everyone in episode three like oh yeah, this is significant. Holy shit, Neil, thanks. <laughs> so, like, he just has a way of doing that. And um, our show would not be anywhere near as good without him putting in that music and scoring everything himself. Like, there is just something that Neil has in him that just makes these things beautiful. So. Yeah. Sorry, I, I was just imagining, <laughs> like, when you said, like, oh, yeah, Neil, that's that's significant. I was imagining, like, Neil just coming in, spray painting on the wall. This scene is significant. <laughs> And then, like, underlining it twice. It's like, that's what his music does. It is like, yeah. it's putting yeah. subtitles for you on the screen. It's... Yeah. I don't disagree with that. <laughs> um, so, when we do our notes, uh, like, I listen to the episode uh, cut, and then Neil adds in the music or makes changes based on what I suggest. And sometimes it is like, oh, hey, this is a nice description. Maybe there should be something here. But sometimes Neil will just, especially in the early days, would just put music in at places. And I, I, I don't remember because all the notes for. The first like 15 episodes i think were on our skype chat and i've since deleted skype and refused to go back to that um but almost all the other notes are, are still somewhere else but i think neil put that music in there i don't think that was my idea didn't you get forced on skype like uh six months ago because of some recording you were doing oh yeah yeah i was very Such unhappy a about nightmare. it <laughs> i hate it i hate it don't don't use skype i hate it <laughs> Um, yeah, I think that's it. I do want to mention one thing, just because I don't think I have a good chance to re-mention this, like, later. Like, the story's moving on, and this little, f like, fly that's stuck in my head, uh, it, like, I, I, w I won't have a reason to talk about it later. Okay. But I think the first time I met you, and we were talking about TLD, and we were talking about the, um, the blood rain, and all the good stuff that happens in the show, and yeah. all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mentioned to you that I was like, I think there's a chance that um the blood rain has nothing to do with the players like i think this was not um a sign from the gods a signal about them and i think that because there's a game i played called arcanum which a lot of people probably played and the beginning of the game you have somebody run up to you and tell you that the opening cinematic was just 100 percent this prophecy and you're clearly the chosen one 
Like, oh yes, I remember you chatting with me about. We chatted about. I think in the White Vault House. I think. Yep. Yep. White yeah. Vault. Uh, White Vault House Mark One. <laughs> what Mark um, One? <laughs> uh, it's um, you are on a blimp and it gets shot down and you have a random like proselytizer just run up to you and goes like, ah, like he falls from the skies on the fiery wings, uh, surrounded by the green <laughs> bodies of his enemies. Like that is you. That's the goblins. Like, you have. You are the chosen one. And then as you play play the game, it turns out like, no, you are not the chosen one. There is a chosen one out there doing shit, but you are a second person just doing <laughs> things and you become very important just through your own actions yeah. and not through prophecy. Uh, and I remember mentioning that. I don't think they're the chosen one. I think they're just a bunch of nerds who happen to be hung at the same time as blood rain from the sky. And I think the blood rain has nothing to do with them. <laughs> and I was proven right. You were. Um... Sorry, spoilers for those who are for some reason listening to this. <laughs> If order. you're listening to the Blissful Eclipse, sorry, beyond the eclipse at the same time as listening to the episodes, don't, please don't. There are so many spoilers in this. That is a very weird way to listen to this. Uh, I get it, but please don't. Um, yeah, uh, so I so I decided early on that, hey, if they died, I will have backups. I will figure out how to make this work, but I'm going to commit to this line and we'll see how it goes. For example... If Ral dies between here and there, not that I want him to, I'm not going to take it too easy, but if he does die between here and there, I will have a backup plan. I will think of something and I will make it fit inside the story. So that's where the idea of having multiple sufferers come from. That's where the idea of having multiple people who work for the cult of the brokenhearted came from. Um, So uh, Ral was a sufferer when you wrote episode one? Yes. Jesus. Raoul was always supposed to be the reason that the heart could be broken out of the mirror. Like, he was the sufferer. Like, Raoul's plot has been determined since before we had his backstory recorded. Since basically before we recorded anything. Um, I had his the idea that he was the key to getting the heart out of the mirror. Probably about the same time, if not just before we started recording the before, before the beginning episode where... The four of us are just chatting shit and doing like, hey, on a scale of one to ten, how blue is the sky? Like, um, like doing those stupid things. I had that plan before we'd recorded absolutely anything. Um, and if Raoul died, then I would have to have another person, another entity step in and take that place, whether it be the new character or whether it be someone that they had to get to that point. Um, I just knew that Bogan would probably still have to be involved to make that work. Um, luckily, I never had to create a backup plan. I just had the kernel of an idea of a backup plan at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a bunch of questions about character deaths and all that good <laughs> stuff, but that will have to come up during a fight that looks especially grievous, and then we can Ooh, probably yeah. talk about it. Oh, yeah. Would give us something to talk about in a fight episode. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I, God, I, have, I hate fight episodes. <laughs> I have a feeling that when Beyond the Eclipse reaches a fight episode, it's going to be a short fucking episode. Well, no, because we have the spider fight coming up fairly soon. Yeah. Um, we you have... say fairly soon. It's like episode eight. <laughs> Right, yeah. <laughs> it yeah. is a, it's a while. Okay, away. it's a few episodes ahead. Yeah. And then we have the fight in in one of the the testing rooms in the episode The Rooms, mm-hmm. I think, um which is episode 9, I believe. Yep. And then I don't think we have like the first real big fight until we're on the boat and even that isn't a real big fight. That's just a fight. Um <laughs> Can't wait for the boat fight. Uh... God, I hate the boat fight. I hate the boat fight so much. I'm like there's no way that after traveling for days down this river that they're not going to be attacked by some thing and of course i fucked myself by giving myself a fire demon with a fire sorceress on board i'm like well i can't show her real power level (laughs) so we won't have a real fight conversation until we hit the water one all right all right well uh that's it for me at least is there anything about episode three you want to get across uh i don't think so i think it's uh it was a good good response to like a good like you know how on a roller coaster you need to go up and up and up and then drop like this was a nice slide down like beginning to build back up again for episode four which um yeah is a a big one (laughs) yeah um the first couple of episodes i've listened to a bunch of them uh preparing for more beyond the eclipse yeah and a lot of them you can like you can almost feel like a clunk between the episodes where there's like a 
there's a setup, there's payoff, there's setup, there's payoff. Like you can ju- like yep. I I don't remember which episode it was. It's the one where they go home with Caitlin, which I think is episode five. Yeah, yeah. Where, where I'm I was sitting there and I was like trying to write notes and it was all just characters and just kind of <laughs> like just development and shit talking and it was just like okay I I can't really. Like th- these are questions for the crew, not for me. Like I, I don't know what to do with any of this. <laughs> I don't know how to dare my way question around this. And like honestly, most of those I'm, and I think we did it in a recent recording. I got to sit back and turn my mic off. Um, I, I enjoy those moments because I get to feel like a player at the table watching other very talented people at the table play um, and emote and push their character stories along without any interference from me. And as a DM or a GM or if you want to call yourselves like. That is just the moments I look for because it knows it lets me know that you're engaged, especially if it's between two people or multiple people and has nothing to do with NPCs. Those are the moments I love and live for. So yeah. Those episodes are good, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, then, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, then I want to just wrap us up here. I want to say thank you, everybody, for listening. And if you enjoyed this episode, per- consider becoming a part of our Patreon. <laughs> we are currently doing Beyond the Eclipse as Patreon goals. Yep. Uh, we might release one on one, just like if we're having, t- we have the time and we want to release something. Uh, but a surefire way to get us to forcefully release <laughs> another one is the Patreon. Um, so we should be doing episode four as part of this, this, pa- this Patreon goal, right? Um, I think so, yes. Okay, so we'll definitely have one more. Yeah. <laughs> After that, Patreon girls, I have to remember to put them up. <laughs> I think they're up. I think we're. Okay. Uh, I'm pretty sure we have. This is off air talk. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for listening, and have a great week. Thanks. Bye. Bye.